Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, so trying to change this up a little bit, trying to relax, calm down, slow it down a little bit because I know that uh, what tends to happen to me a lot if I get really, really worked up and I start talking really, really fast, I tend to take longer to say less. So I'm trying this little practice where I just kind of slow it down a little bit and kind of take toll of what's going on be able to very specifically deliver content to y'all. And then also not to mention the fact too that I just really need to change up my scenery. As you can see, I'm sitting in my living room now, doing like a little couch chat with y'all, you know what I mean? Like kind of just like flipping in a different place. Because this is something I would highly recommend for y'all, is if you're doing your schoolwork in the same place every single day, try to change it up a little bit. Try to go somewhere a little bit different. Try to like go to a different room in your house, go outside, something like that because it makes this stuff a lot easier, okay? But let's go ahead and get into it. We're now getting into the last of two flips that you have before your test. Now, this flip will be a little bit longer. I'm thinking close to like 30-ish minutes, uh, talking about imperialism and imperialism in, uh, British imperialism in China and British imperialism in India. And then we'll have one super short flip over the weekend for... A and D period going into your test on Monday, which you can go ahead and knock out. I'll probably, I'm, I might be able to get it up there by the end of the day on Friday, um, or I might be able to get it up tomorrow. We'll get it up there though, okay? So don't worry too much about it. But the number one thing that we're getting into now is your very last ism. So the last ism that we're talking about is that of imperialism. We've talked about a lot of isms so far. Talked about conservatism, conservatism, classical liberalism, socialism. Those are our three big political isms that I put inside that ism tree that I posted on Google Classroom. And then we talked about nationalism. And we talked about industrialism. And now we're talking about imperialism. Now there are two other imperialisms or isms I could bring up, and that's capitalism and communism. But we're going to wait to kind of microanalyze those a little bit more in the next unit when we get into the Russian Revolution because they had a communist revolution. So I'm going to try and take that two seconds to be like, oh, communism came from here. It's an idea by Karl Marx, whatever, whatever. Now, we're talking mainly about imperialism, its big beginnings, its effect, lingering effects. And the biggest thing about these next two videos is just don't mute them or else this is you down here in the corner, okay? But let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? So let's talk about what imperialism is before we go any further. What imperialism is, is the policy of extending rule or authority of an empire or country over a foreign nation. Now, usually when you're doing this, you're using one of two things, your military or your politics. Now, what I mean by politics is like your government, okay? Some of y'all immediately are like, wait a minute, Mr. Terry, back up. Didn't we talk about this already with, like, England and Jamestown and... With, like, England and Jamestown and as well as, you know, the other colonies started by the French and Canada going all the way down to Louisiana. Didn't we talk about this then? Not really, because that's different. That's colonialism. Okay, colonialism is the concept of sending a lot of people to start colonies. Those colonies expand, they grow, give birth to more people. Eventually those colonies may become self-sustaining like the ones we talked about in Latin America. Imperialism is sending your military or your ruling force of body to take over an area that's already inhabited by people, mostly by natives. Now, some of y'all are like, well, there were Native Americans in North America. Yeah, you're right, but they were sparsely spread out, mostly semi-nomadic. Uh, they weren't like India, which was a self, which was a self-sustaining society at certain points. They weren't like China, which was a self-sustaining society, not necessarily tribal people. Now, some of y'all are like, well, what about Africa? Look, there's a lot of asterisks to all this stuff. Just take a deep breath. What you really need to know is imperialism is the big trend in the 1800s. Uh, now we got to get into speaking of what are the motivations behind imperialism? Why are all these Europeans deciding to imperialize other places? Well, the biggest reason up front, as we all know, is always going to be economics. The biggest reason behind it, why any of these countries really do anything ever is in the pursuit of making money or growing power. 
which oftentimes are the exact same thing with different names. So by the late 1800s, most of this is happening during the late 1800s, usually from 1850 and on, Europeans are going to start owning most of the world. Uh, and what I mean by most of the world, I mean like most of the world that's, it's just hard to explain. If I throw up a map real quick of how much world was controlled by European countries by the late 1800s, it's absolutely astonishing. Uh, there's a huge amount of control in places like Africa and Southeast Asia, and they're kind of doing all this in the pursuit of one thing, money. They want to make more money. And the reason why, they, the, how they're going to make money off these places is they want to use their military to go set up shop and then find ways to force the native inhabitants of these other countries to mine, grow, or create resources they already have and end up giving them or selling them, quote unquote, to the Europeans. Some of the big resources that these Europeans are after in these imperialized areas are palm oil, which was very, 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 very big for keeping factory machines running that actually was happening or from the Industrial Revolution. Rubber, due to the fact that in the last, like in the late 1800s, a French, uh, French engineer invented the very first automobile, which needed rubber for its tires. Uh, cotton, uh, which was the cheapest textile you could make and grow. A lot of the imperialists from Britain wanted to go to India to grow that. Iron, copper, gold, diamonds, and another big one is ivory or elephant tusk. Okay, so that is exactly what the Europeans wanted. They want to go to these places because none of it is native in Europe. Palm oil, rubber, cotton, iron, well, iron's a little bit, uh, copper, gold, diamonds, those things don't exist in Europe anymore, or it can't grow there. So the Europeans want to go to these other places to set up shop and get it there. So going forward, another big motivator, the second biggest motivator for imperialism is that of this other ism that we've been talking about, nationalism. So now that a lot of these countries are growing at a very rapid rate, countries like Great Britain, France, Germany now is officially a country as of 1871, and they want to get in on the imperial game. And Belgium ends up imperializing a huge chunk of Africa in the middle called the Belgian Free State, or the Congo Free State, which it was not free and not nice whatsoever. It was one of the biggest atrocities in history. King Leopold II is a terrible person. Uh, he's one of my like top five worst people in all of history. But going further, though, these countries like France, Great Britain, Germany... Uh, Russia even, not as much, but some, they want to take over more area to try and kind of show off, to give national pride to their people. The, uh, they believe that the growing of their empire overseas and abroad and taking over other places is going to lead to more ability to grow their power, and that power is related to their nationalism because they believe they're doing their country good and their countrymen good by extending their control. Now, to give you an example of this nationalism, this uh, book is called An ABCs for Baby Patriots. It was written in 1899 by Mrs. Ernest Ames. And she is trying to show the dominance of British imperialism in this. Because as you can see, B and C, like you remember the little ABC books when you had when you were a kid, like B stands for banana and C stands for cat, right? So like stuff like that. This is one that was written during the time of imperialism. And as you can see, B stands for battles by which England's name has forever been covered with glory and fame. And C stands for colonies. Rightly we boast that of all the great nations, Great Britain has the most. That's an ex like an example of this nationalism presence that exists within imperialism. They want to keep growing and taking over things to make their country look better and look more powerful and strong. Now, other smaller, like JV-level motivators include religion, because a lot of these imperializers were backed by missionaries and by other certain Christian faiths, and they believed that they were saving the savage peoples of Africa and Southeast Asia from themselves and a life in eternity in a bad place, which I think they were doing fine up until, you know, you didn't really need to do that, but I understand spreading faith's a great thing, but spreading the good news is one thing, but using it as a reason to take over places and force them to do things for you is another. Uh, military outposts is another big one, right? Creating a place where you can easily attack your enemies from. Military outposts uh, is like another JV one. And another crazy one is foreign markets. So a lot of 
these other imperialistic powers were creating things inside of their factories. Like, for example, Great Britain was very well known for making cheap textiles coming out of their factories. Well, once you sell these cheap textiles to your own people, you now have market saturation. Market saturation is when, like, everybody already has one of these things in your country, so they have no reason to buy another one. Uh, well, Britain realized that by growing into places like India, you now have another market that you can sell these cheap goods to. So that's another one, selling a foreign, like selling to foreign areas. Now, why though did it take so long? Why did it have to wait until 1850? Why did the Europeans not imperialize other places sooner? How come, you know, when the siren song of colonialism starts in around like 1790, how come they didn't start imperializing them? Why did it take them 60 extra years? Uh, well, a lot of it has to do going back to that Industrial Revolution, right? The Industrial Revolution didn't really truly amp up until the late 1700s, early 1800s. And by ramp up, I mean, I'm talking about some of the biggest inventions, including that of like James Watt's steam engine, which was invented in 1776, uh, along with liberty in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, that was invented and it's going to take time for those things to progress. And as those things progress, those things progress, 1850 starts serving as a year where industrialists believe that they can take these new products out of their factories and they can use them to imperialize or take over foreign nations in places like Southeast Asia or Africa. Some of the technology that's going to help the imperializers do this is stuff like uh, steamboats, for example, is a big one. Like, for example, in Africa, their rivers are very hard to navigate due to the fact that they're very, very long, very, very wide, and you need to be able to get up and down them easily. A rowboat ain't gonna do it for you. Well, a steamboat can. Steamboat's gonna chug all the way up as long as there's lumber to feed the furnace inside of your steam engine, you can keep that steamboat moving. Uh, so that's gonna give them a huge ability as well. Stop filming me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> going forward though, other things that are gonna help them out are modern machinery, Another big one is the Maxim gun, which was invented in the late 1800s as well, closer to some of the earliest working models, I believe, were like 1866. Uh, let me double check that for you. It was invented by a guy named Hiram Maxim, though, and where it's located is right down here in the bottom left hand of your screen. Uh, it, the Maxim gun is the very, very first fully automatic machine gun, and that machine gun can fire upwards of 200 rounds per minute without having to be reloaded. That's talking about pulling down the trigger and just and like the explosion of the ga the release of gas and force out of the machine gun or out of the shell, the cartridge of the bullet itself, propels a firing pin backwards on a spring and then ejects that cartridge and reloads a new one and then it does it again. And that's just by holding that whole thing down. Uh, 1884, it's saying, was the most recent one. Stop it! My wife keeps recording it. Uh, so anyway. 1884 was like one of the first operable machine guns, but also not to mention breech loading rifles, bolt action rifles were another big thing. And modern medicine is going to be a big thing that gives the imperializers the ability to go out and imperialize. Uh, the biggest one is this one down here. Some of you are like, Bayer Aspirin? No, like Bayer Aspirin was a little bit later. Uh, that's again by a German company. But this is a big different one. There's a tree that grows in South America that produces a bark and that bark can be synthesized into a certain medicine called quinine medicine. Quinine is this stuff down here, and if you take it, it can alleviate the effects of malaria. And malaria is very heavily present in the middle of Africa, and malaria is carried by mosquitoes, and when you get malaria, it can very easily kill you. And for the longest time before 1850, Europeans didn't have access to medicine like that, but now after the Industrial Revolution post-1850, quinine medicine is in a lot more effect. The Dutch are growing it in a lot of different islands in Indonesia, and they're really doing it up. So now the imperialists have the technology to do it, including things like steamboats, steam locomotives, Maxim guns, military technology, and even medicines like quinine medicine. So the British best example of imperializers, period, is the British, all right? The British take over the most stuff. There's an old saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire, right? Uh, that actually has been attributed to a lot of different empires throughout history, but that's the best example. Now, one of the best, biggest examples of them taking somebody over, though, or imperializing someone, is going to be that of their efforts inside of China, okay? 
which is ridiculous. And so real quick, so we can understand why they imperialized them, we kind of need to rewind back a little bit. So I know we just kind of accelerated all the way up to 1850 and passed it. We're talking about the ability for Europeans to imperialize. But if we're going to truly understand why the British imperialized China, then we got to kind of roll them back a little bit to like the 1790s, okay? So the British and China, their efforts are going to kind of start bubbling up. Sweetheart, speaking of tea, Maria. Your tea is on, so. Yeah, could you dump that into my pitcher right there? Sorry, I'm brewing tea so right now. So dump the tea into the Boston Harbor? That's completely different. <laughs> All right, so anyway. I can history too. You're talking about two very different timelines. All right, so the tea, could you squeeze the bags out and then pour that into the thingy in there? Only if you leave the Boston Harbor comment. I will leave your <laughs> Boston Tea Party comment in the video. Cambridge. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, so in the 1790s, Britain is broke. Speaking of what my wife was just talking about, though, the reason why they were so broke is because of the American Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, but they have no money and they're in extreme amounts of debt. Uh, but the thing about it is, China is not. China was making lots of money, tons of cash, mainly due to the fact that they were economically self-isolated. Now, that means that China was closed to other parts of Europe. That's a big thing. Next to this economic self-isolation, but they were closed, okay? It's a big key word. That means their doors were shut to Western traders. They didn't allow Western traders to come in. Stop laughing in there. They didn't allow... Are you sure they were open? I'm going... <laughs> they get opened later. That's why this is important. You're messing me up. I'm going... <laughs> Get, I almost said get back in the kitchen would have been which would have been so messed up to say, but I'm not gonna say that. Anyway, they were closed. <laughs> anyway, this economic isolation, they didn't allow Western traders to come into their country and trade their goods. And the reason why is because China produced a lot of amazing goods, so they didn't have to they didn't need Western products. They produced porcelain, which was a fantastic material for them. They produced their own tea, which was the beverage of choice of everyone else in Western Europe. And they also produced silk as their cheap textile, which can was considered a luxury item in Western areas. Now, speaking of this whole thing being closed off to other Europeans. They had developed this thing called the Canton system. There was one port city in China where you could actually trade, and it's now known as Guangzhou, but originally it was called Canton. And the Canton system was that if a Western trader wanted to sell their goods to China, they had to sell them to Chinese merchants who would then go out and sell them in China. Now, the Chinese merchants would charge taxes, ports fees, and all this other stuff, so it was kind of disadvantaging these Western traders, and the Chinese were very, very lucrative and making lots of money, right? So, thing is, though, what ends up happening is one of the most screwed up things in all of history. Britain is losing a lot of money, particularly because they have to go to China to buy one good, one good they desperately want, and that good is what my wife was just pouring into a pitcher just now, which was tea. So the British were addicted to tea. Literally, actually addicted to it. 10% of all British household incomes went to buying and purchasing tea because one of the only places you could buy it in the world was in China. They had the climate to grow it, they had the people to grow it, they had the system to grow it. And so you could buy tea from them. Now, Britain's society revolves around tea. They have tea times. They literally have it every day. It is much more popularly drank in Britain as a beverage of choice than coffee. Uh, going further with this, though, so the British decide that they have to figure out a way to get their, che their tea for cheap. And how are they going to do that? Maybe they can find a good that they have that the Chinese want really bad that they can trade for it straight up. Well, they don't produce porcelain, they don't make silk, so what can you do? Oh, how about, oh, I don't know, let's sell them drugs. So there's this drug that is very, 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 very illegal in China during this time period. This drug is called opium. It's made from these plants down here called poppy plants. Now, the poppy plants make flowers, and there's a very, very famous scene in Wizard of Oz that actually makes reference to this thing. Poison in it, I think. With poison in it. 
but attractive to the eye and soothing to the smell. <laughs> Puppies. Puppies. Puppies will put them to sleep. So as you can see, the poppy plant, when they're in these little bud forms right here, inside of it they have this milky substance. And that milky substance is home to different molecules like codeine, morphine, heroin molecules as well. This plant is used to make the common street drug today known as heroin. It's also used to make, used to make opioid-based painkillers like Oxycontin. Now, the big thing about this opium, though, is it was highly illegal in China. So Britain decides that they're going to grow opium for dirt cheap in India, which grows very, very well, bring it to the Chinese borders, trade that for tea with Chinese smugglers, and that means the Chinese smugglers are going to make a lot of money, and the, Ch and the British are going to get the tea for nothing, pretty much, and they'll take it back to England and Europe, and they'll sell it for a huge profit. So they're literally trading tea for drugs. Sorry, those are our neighbor dogs. Tea for drugs straight up so they can go back to Europe and sell it for a lot. Now, but remember, opium is stupid illegal in China because it turns the people who use it into practical zombies. They take it and they fall into this delirium and they it's a huge depressant. So, like, the person who's using it is not an effective member of society. So... And the British are highly aware of this, and they know fully well that, you know, this is going to destroy the Chinese people as a society, but they're going to do it anyway. And so they start selling them tea for drugs, all right? So it's crazy. Now, the Chinese are going to appoint, appoint an entire government task force to stop the sale of opium. And the way they're going to do this is by trying to get their own staffers to dump it into the sea and seizing it at ports, right? Almost like what she was talking about with the Boston Tea Party, right? So the Chinese have collected an entire task force to try and catch the smugglers bringing the opium in that the British gave them, and when they get it, they'll dump it all out into the ocean. Now, or they'll destroy it, or they'll burn it. Uh, now, and they also tried to close opium dens and find users and bring them up on charges as well as much as possible. Craziest thing ends up going down, though, and at one point... The guy that was elected to do this by the Chinese emperor uh, was, I think it was like Lin, Lin Zhu. Uh, he seized 21,000 chests of opium, drug, and had them destroyed. Now, when this happened, the British, the, Brit, the, Brit, the British demanded compensation for this drug. They were like, no, 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 we grew it legally where we were, and we gave it to some guys, so we would like some of the money to compensate us for this, because we never said it was legal, you said it's legal. And the Chinese are going to be like, no, you're trying to destroy our country from the inside out. And this is going to lead to these things called the Opium Wars. Now, the Opium Wars, there's going to be two of them. One, the first one, from 1839 to 1842, and the second one from 1853 to 1860 are going to break out. Now, the Chinese are going to lose both of these wars tremendously badly. They're going to get absolutely shellacked by the British Navy. And the reason being is because for thousands of years, China was much more modern than Europe. They were having a golden age, inventing gunpowder and the printing press and all this other amazing stuff when the Europeans were having the Middle Ages and they were farming dirt and dying of plague. Uh, but the, something happened in the Renaissance period where the Chinese began to kind of plateau on their technological advancement. A lot of historians believe this is due to that economic self-isolation. If you are economically isolated and you're completely independent with inside the borders of your own country, you don't have a reason to keep developing new things to keep advancing. You're doing completely fine, so you don't have a reason to develop new technologies. There's also a lot of other reasons. Some historians uh, argue that the Industrial Revolution occurred in Britain due to the fact that coal and iron reserves are closer to the surface and the ones in China are lower and deeper in the ground, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different reasons, a lot of different reasons. But the Chinese are going to lose both these wars because they are technologically far behind the British. The British have larger vessels that are equipped with cannons and better weaponry, while the Chinese were going into this fight still spouting bows and arrows, spears and swords. Uh... But the Americans, the French, and the Russians are also going to jump in, and they are going to do what's known as 
opening China. That's why it was so important before my wife talked so much junk. China was going to be opened after the losses of these opium wars, and spheres of influence are going to be established. Now, what I mean by opened is China now had to allow Western traders to come in and sell whatever they wanted, and like they were officially opened up to the rest of the world. Now, these spheres of influence were established when all the other great European powers started grabbing up little port cities and making them theirs. So, for example, the Russians took north, the northern end of China, closer to Korea. The French took Indochina below Hong Kong. The British took Hong Kong and bought it from the Chinese and literally were like, this is ours now. Uh, Chinese ports were now fully owned and operated by these other European powers. Merchants were not subject to Chinese laws. They were only subject to laws of their own home countries. And China had to pay them to allow them to keep using their land. This is a great example of imperialism. Rebellions are going to rise up in protest of their government as well as foreign rule. Some of these rebellions include the Taipang Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion. And these uprisings are going to be crushed by the European powers with the loss of millions of Chinese lives. In the Taipang Rebellion alone, over 20 million people died, which is absolutely insane. Now this is a map of the spheres of influence within the Chinese Empire. So as you can see, the, the green is all still owned and operated by the Chinese, but the British right here in pink got a hold of Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, as well as this area of uh, China going all the way down to Canton and Hong Kong. The French took what is down here as French Indochina, and then the Germans are going to pick up Sing Zet, or like Sing Tao right there, and like it's a very, very aggressive expansion, and they've literally thrown the doors to China open and forced them to Western trade. But now we got to get into the British in India. And I know a lot of y'all right now are immediately saying, wow, the British are kind of taking over everything. What I say, sun never sets on the British Empire. They took over just about everything. They're some of the worst examples of imperializers in all of Western civilization and Western history. And it's the, uh, a lot of progressive people today do not look kindly on it. Their museums are stocked full of artifacts from other areas and a lot of people are demanding that they're being given back. It's a large movement going on in Britain right now. Uh, but they're not alone. Let's not pretend like America did not imperialize people. We imperialized Hawaii, places in Alaska, Alaska, like uh, the Philippine Islands. We are just as bad. Everybody did it during this time period. Now, the British are going to very effectively take over India, though, as well. And in 1600, now traveling all the way back again, going all the way back, a company... An entire company was started simply to trade goods in India. And y'all remember it as the British East India Company. We talked about this company a while back. Remember the three crosses, the E, the I, and the C? Not the Dutch one, but the British one was created. And this was created specifically to go to India in the pursuit of spices and other goods. Now, the British are going to begin to settle into India at port cities only and slowly start working their way into society. Now, this was never a direct rule by the British yet. This was a rule by their company. The British East India Company was doing this. They would set up in port cities and establish small provinces, and they would take advantage of India by signing treaties and documents with local princes. And these local princes were called Rajas. And the biggest reason why they went to India is due to the fact that India was not controlled by a central ruling body. So you have to understand why India, because India was very fragmented, okay? Fragmented by the fact that they didn't have central leaders. Now, some people will argue this with me all day, and they'll be like, well, what about the Mughal or the Gupta Empires? Well, the Gupta Empire was around like 300 AD, so you can go ahead and throw that one out. And the Mughal Empire by this point was already slowly starting to retreat, and a lot of the land that they are leaving behind is being gobbled up by these Rajas. These Rajas are then signing these treaties with the British, okay? So these Rajas, though, are going to be giving up a lot of this land and a lot of trade rights to these British, in, like to the British East India Company. And it's not just the Brits. They were signing with the French on the western coast of India, the Dutch at the southern tip of India. The Portuguese were there for quite some time, as we already know. They went there first in 1497. Vasco da Gama went all the way around Africa, came all the way back, and started some of this whole trend. Well, the British are going to then start taking a kind of a soft-handed approach early on with your or India. And they're going to establish a system known as indirect rule, okay? 
they're going to start leaving local rulers in charge, like I was talking about with the Rajas. The Rajas would be left behind to produce goods, farm spices, take care of all the processing, and then they would be selling it to the British at a dirt cheap rate off the labor of their own people. Now, this was accomplished in the earliest phases of British imperialism during the early 1800s. With less than a thousand British people, they were controlling over 300 million Indian people. So this is a concept known as indirect rule. I'm not going to go there and rule over it myself. That's colonialism. Instead, using indirect rule, you leave a local ruler in charge. You leave a Raj in charge to rule other Indian people, and that person reports back to you. Now, British motivations, though, over time, as indirect rule begins to grow, is going to change to military, marketing, as well as a grower of new raw materials. So as the Industrial Revolution gets kicked up, Britain realizes that, ooh, we have a place that we could take over completely, and take all to ourselves, kick all the other European powers out, and we now would have a place for our military functionality. We would now have a place for a new market. We'd be able to sell cheap goods to the Indian people. And we all now also will have a grower of new raw materials, like the opium we want to sell to the Chinese, or like cotton to put into our factories back in Europe and stock it full of cheap cotton, and then we can make cheap cotton textiles and sell it back to the Indians all over again. And this circle just keeps wrapping around and around and around, right? So the British are going to start taking over now parts of India using their military directly. Now, some of y'all are saying, was this sent by the British government? No, still only the British East India Company, but completely signed off on by the ruling class of Britain, which at this point was uh, under Queen Victoria. Now... The good things that British people brought with them, let's not pretend that some positive things did not happen when the British went to rule over parts of India, because they did. Uh, there's, they're kind of masked in negative, though. So the British wanted to use Indian trade to try and make money for themselves. Now, in the process, they're going to end up making money for upper-class Indians as well, and there's going to be the growth of this new Indian middle class that never actually existed before the British ever got there. In India, it was extremely stratified. You were extremely poor or you were extremely wealthy. Now, when the British show up to set up their imperial operations, they end up basically creating an Indian middle class. The British are also going to try and destroy this thing called the caste system. Now, the caste system is a social, social class system that is a part of the Hindu faith that existed in pre-industrialized and pre-imperial Europe. Now, Hinduism has a lot of very key beliefs. The key beliefs including that of karma, reincarnation, and the caste system. Now, let's talk about how all those three of these things work together. So here is a symbol of the caste system right here. So as you can see, there's about five social classes in Hindu or in Hindu-based India, particularly southern India during this time period. The Brahmins going all the way down to the Dalits, right? The Brahmins, the highest class you can be is a priest and a teacher, and then going all the way down to warriors, farmers, laborers, and then all the way down to the Dalits at the bottom. Now, as a part of the Hindu faith, the Hindus believed that how you lived your past lives denoted where you would be born in your next life in society. So they thought that if you were a Brahmin, that means that you lived several very good past lives and you followed the laws of karma and you were a good Hindu and that means that as you died, you would be reborn. That's that process of reincarnation, that this is just one temporary life for me, that when I die, I will be reborn again my soul will be reborn again just in a different body in a different social class. And then if I keep living great lives, I'll keep bumping up the social class systems because I'm following karma. I'm putting out positive energy into the universe instead of negative energy. And I'll keep bumping up the system. And the eventual goal of the karmic like ideas of the caste system is that you will leave this earthly plane altogether and be unified with the ultimate Hindu god, which is Brahma. All right, so that's how the caste system works. Now, the British destroyed this whole thing because it sounds kind of neat. It's very interesting to study. But the thing about it is it was also very unfair to Indian people within Indian society. And this is something that existed in their society for thousands of years. Because down here at the very, very, very bottom were the Dalits, also known as the untouchables. Dalits had to live in segregated neighborhoods because they were so poor. They were only allowed to sweep the streets or clean toilets or public 
places, bathroom facilities. They had to carry an instrument with them everywhere they went called a clapper, which when they would be warning people in the streets that they were coming because everybody thought that they were full of disease, which is very, very negative. So the British are going to outlaw that, which is a very good thing. Um, and it still doesn't it sort of exist today in India, but not really in the same strength that it ever did in pre-imperial India. Now, they're going to improve roads and infrastructure. They're also going to try and improve women's place in society in India. Now, women in Hindu culture before the British ever got there um, were subject to a lot of very strict laws and very, very strict... Uh, very messed up laws inside of the Indian culture. Um, if you were within the lower classes, if you were the upper classes, you could actually have a lot of very liberated women. But in the lower classes, if your husband died, you had to commit this thing known as sati, which is spelled S-U-T-T-E-E, -E, and it's demonstrated over here. If your husband died, you had to throw yourself on his funeral pyre and kill yourself because you were nothing without your husband. All right, so... The British tried to outlaw this practice of sati, and that's a good thing that they did. But like I said, all these good things were outweighed heavily by the giant amount of negative things that the British did when they imperialized India. Uh, one of the biggest things is it's going to cause massive amounts of revolts that are going to cost a lot of Indian lives. Uh, they're also going to begin to draft Indian men into their military, and they called these men sepoys, or sepoys, right? S-E-P-O-Y-S -E is demonstrated right here which is an Indian soldier forced to serve in a British military. Now, these sepoys are dressed like this. So this is a sepoy officer right here. This is a sepoy regular infantryman demonstrated right here. Now, these men, okay, well, actually, the regular infantrymen are out back here in the back. The sepoy mutiny happened in 1857 when a lot of crazy stuff happened. And this kind of carries in with this forcing Christian laws, and the Hindus are going to re resist. Uh, notice really quick that they are obviously not dressed much like an Indian would normally. And for an Indian person to be wearing these things is a little ridiculous. But the biggest thing that is very ridiculous is the gun that they're holding. The gun they're holding is an 1853 infield rifle. Now, these guns are muskets. They're like front-loading muskets. You have to take the bullet pack, put it inside your mouth, tear it, dump all of that into the end of the barrel, ramrod that down in there, take the paper, throw that in there, ramrod that down in there, pull back, blasting cat, flow. That's until you finally got it off. Now, a rumor had been starting to go around the sepoys, though, saying that the ends of these blast or the ends of these cartridges were sealed shut with this stuff called tallow. And tallow is a mixture of pig and cow fat. Now, Hindus believe that cows are a sacred animal and northern Indians were Muslim and they believe pigs are an unclean animal. So you just not have only offended one but two faiths by forcing them to stick this thing in their mouth because it's violating their religious laws. So the craziest part about it is though is there's not any definitive evidence that says that tallow was ever used to actually seal the ends of these bullet packs at all. Uh, but the rumor had already taken hold. And sepoys are going to start mutinying at a very huge rate for over a year. But the British are going to come in and they're going to crush these mutinies in absolute massacres and kill hundreds of thousands of Indian people and the leaders that actually led these mutinies. Now, also deforestation, when the British are going to burn down forests to build factories and railroads. Uh, population growth in India is also going to cause widespread famine. And that's it, okay? So that's what we're talking about. And where we're leaving off right now is the British are still in China and in India. And that is imperialism part one. So you have a short flip over the weekend going into your tests on Monday. And when I say short, it's going to be pretty short. It'll only be about like 10, 12 minutes. Um, so, but make sure you get that done so you can know the last little bit of stuff for your test. I'll see you guys later. Y'all doing great. Keep up the good work. Talk to y'all later on.